Let's get into the message today. Somebody say the weight. The weight. Come on, everybody. Say the weight, the weight. And, the and the suddenly. Thank you. I want to talk to you today as we start our new year with God to understand two types of seasons in your life. Everybody's going to have two types of seasons. You're going to have the weight, and then you're going to have the suddenly. I want to show it to you in the scriptures. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. In the book of Acts, we see that Christ has raised from the dead, and he's about ready to ascend to heaven. Here he's speaking to the disciples, giving them his last instructions. Starting in verse 4, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. You see, sometimes we've got to stay and not leave to receive a promise. I'm talking to somebody right now. Don't leave that marriage. Stay and wait for a promise. Am I talking to anybody? Come on. I'm talking to some children right now. Don't leave your family. Stay until God's promise comes. Some of you are frustrated on your job, and God might be speaking to you right now. Stay. Don't leave until the promise comes. He said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. To understand the context here, Jesus is now going to the Father. We believe God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so as Jesus came to earth to die for our sins, after he has rose from the dead, he's going to ascend back. But how are we going to have a relationship with God? Through the Holy Spirit. Now, if you notice in this context, there's nothing about salvation. And so, yes, the work of the Holy Spirit first is to save us and to make us born again. Somebody say born again. again. Thank you. But this is not to be born again. They had already been born again. It records it at the end of the book of John that Jesus said he, uh, he breathed the Holy Spirit on them. And afterward, he said, receive. That means they were born again that moment. So why did he say before he ascended to heaven, wait for the Holy Spirit? I thought he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He's already done that. If you read chronologically through the Gospels, you'll see he's already did that. What this is talking about is the Holy Spirit doing a second work in the Christian's life for power. Let's turn in our scriptures to Acts chapter 1 verse 8, just so you can continue on. Don't take my word for it. Jesus says, but you will receive what? You will receive what? Power. Thank you when the Holy Spirit comes on you. It doesn't say you're going to get saved when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Of course the Holy Spirit saves us. That's what happens in John when Jesus teaches about being born again. They had already had that experience. What he is now saying is a second experience. Another experience you're going to wait for is for the Holy Spirit to come on you and you're going to receive dunamis power in the Greek, dynamite, explosive energy from God, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So let's go back to the notes and understand this. They had to wait for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in power. Now let's go to the next chapter, Acts chapter 2. Somebody say, I'm with you, Pastor. Good. Before we launch off into application, I just want you to see the context. In Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, which is 50 days after Passover, that's when Jesus died, and then he spent 40 days with them, so it's been about 10 days. They were literally in one place waiting for the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Somebody say, suddenly, suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them. Somebody say all of them. Thank you. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages as the Spirit enabled them. So there was a waiting period and then there was a suddenly period when it came up or when rather he, the Holy Spirit came upon him because the Holy Spirit's not an it. He's not a fourth, like, oh, I feel the fourth of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm so spiritual. No, he's not an it, no more than you're an it. You have a spirit and you're not an it, okay? And when he came, he gave them this amazing power. Let's put it together in context. Jesus said, wait. For the Holy Spirit to give you power. They waited. Suddenly, the power came. 
Do you see where I'm going with this today? Let's look at some people in the Bible and see how there was a wait and there was a suddenly. When you look to the scriptures, you see those two uh, seasons continually. A pattern is developing. There are very little evidences in the Bible of overnight successes in the Bible. Almost the entire Bible is built on the concept of wait and suddenly. Abraham waited 10 years for God to suddenly give him a son. And if you include the time before the promise, he had to wait to be around 100. So he had to be 100 years old to become a father for the first time. From the time God met with them, it was 10 years. Joseph waited 22 years for God to suddenly bring his family to him in gratitude. If you know the story, Joseph was promised that his family would be rescued by him and actually bow down and give him honor. He got that as a young man. He had to wait 22 years to go from being thrown into a pit and then being work, uh, working as a slave in Potiphar's house to being then thrown in prison wrongly for Potiphar's wife lying on him to finally be brought to the Pharaoh to then have the power of the promise. Amen. There's a lot of peas there. <laughs> From the pit to Potiphar to prison to Pharaoh to see the power of the promise. Waited 22 years, but suddenly it came and happened. Moses, he killed an Egyptian and then God exiled him to the desert. God basically said, Moses, you've done it wrong. I'm going to kill a lot more than this. But you got to take a timeout. God gives timeouts. And he gave Moses a timeout for 40 years. Then suddenly he appeared to him in a burning bush. Imagine being Moses that day. You've gone 38 years, nothing has changed. 39 years, nothing has changed. And then 40 years, God shows up. Are we getting a lesson here? You can give up before your miracle. Don't do that. Oftentimes, God is doing something in the process. There is a purpose for what you and I are going through while we're waiting. And then lastly, Israel, through the prophet Daniel, was given a literal year of when Jesus, the Messiah, would come. Study the 70 weeks of Daniel. Daniel gets it to the year that Jesus would come. But guess how far in the future that was? Over 400 years, the people of Israel had to wait for the sudden uh, incarnation of Jesus to come to the Virgin Mary. I mean, you want to talk about waiting a long time, uh, husbands, for your wives to get done shopping. Or parents, talk about waiting for your kids to get ready in the morning. You're waiting a long time. This is longer than any time we could imagine. 400 years, generations are coming and going, and yet they're still waiting. And we could say like this, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus has left and promised to come back, but there's a suddenly coming, a trumpet from the heaven. He's coming back, amen? And it's going to catch everybody by surprise, but we're going to say, we were waiting for you, Jesus. And so while we're waiting for our suddenlies, let's look back on the suddenlies that have already came. Some of us have waited for our spouse, and now we're married. We need to thank God for that. Others of us waited to have children, and we need to thank God for that. Some of you young people waited to get in high school, and now you're here. And so we need to see that God's been faithful in the past, and we need to be thankful. And then at the same time, we need to now be patient in the new things we're waiting for. So let's talk about the lessons in the waiting. I know it's not the most funnest thing to talk about. And I know that it may not work on our calendar, but if we can get it into our mind that God's never late, he's never early, but he's always what? On time. We can prepare ourselves better for this year. The first thing that we need to know in the waiting is to remember that God is still with us. So as we're waiting for the thing to come or that person to come into our life, who do we still have that's most important that's with us? God. So what's more important to you, what God has in his hand or what he has in his heart? Are you just seeking his hand or are you seeking his face? You see, we need to have it in our lives right now that no matter what goals we've set up, no matter what things we want to accomplish, and they ought to be good things, no matter how awesome those things are, the most important thing is God and he's already with us. So it only gets better from here. Look at what Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, because of your enemies. For the Lord your God goes with you. Somebody say, he goes with me. To the DMV. Oh, come on. Somebody say, he goes with me. 
when I call Comcast. Come on, somebody say, he goes with me when I drive in traffic. Oh, he goes with you. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. What a blessing. So what promises are you waiting for this year? Do not let the longing for that promise distract you from the reality that God's already with you. You have that which is most important. You have the God of heaven and earth with you. And if you're not born again, get born again, as we were talking about before. And then you can say, God is with me. The second thing that we have to know in the waiting is that we're not just sitting here tapping our watch, you know, tapping our foot or something. We're moving in the waiting. Look at how the Bible defines waiting similar to how we would define moving. It sounds like, oh, maybe it's two opposite things. No, it's actually the same thing. Because, you know, as I teased about my wife going shopping, what do I do while I'm waiting? I get on the phone. I answer calls. I do different things. I take use of that time. What do I do now? When I go to the DMV, I put on podcasts. You see, I'm moving while I'm waiting. I'm making moves, in other words, while I'm not uh, being able to make moves in this way. And so this is what we have to understand. Waiting for God to do this thing doesn't mean you can't be busy doing the thing you already have. Just because you're waiting to own your first home doesn't mean you can't be busy in saving. Just because you're waiting to get married doesn't mean you can't be busy in working on your character as a single person. Are you following me on this? You can be busy in the meantime. And the Bible teaches us like this in Isaiah 40, 30 through 31. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fail. Now, I want to tell you, I used to be young. You look at me now and you're like, Pastor, I don't believe it. But yes, children, I didn't always have gray hair. And one day you will too, by the way. That will suddenly come. Uh, you look at your life and how fast it's gone. But I can tell you this. When I used to be young and strong and stay up all night and then try to go to work the next day, I actually still got tired. I know some of my kids say, I want to stay up all night. But some of them got tired during New Year's Eve, you know. So even the strongest among us, among us will get tired. Now I just get tired all the time, right? I'm just older and I get tired. But that doesn't mean we can't receive strength because watch the secret here. It says, yes, even young people get tired, but they that wait, and in that Hebrew word wait is a lot packed into it. Those who serve, it also means that. Those who worship, because when it's saying wait, it means like waiter, a waiter. You're waiting on the Lord. You're serving the Lord. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They're going to be like a never-ending story, riding on a big creature. They're going to be like in Lord of the Rings, flying an eagle. Wouldn't you like to fly on an eagle? It says, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so while we are waiting, we shouldn't get tired and lazy and lethargic. We should be passionate about the things God has us to do, waiting and worshiping and serving. Can I hear an amen? amen. Stay busy for God. The, last, uh, the second to last thing about waiting is we need to learn to celebrate others' victories. It's real easy while you're waiting for your breakthrough to hate on somebody that does have a breakthrough. Oh, pastor makes 65 and his wife makes 50. I wish I had that. Were you there when we had nothing? Were you there when I was the only one giving in the tithe and offering? Were you there when I was tempted to quit but didn't? I mean, you don't know my story, right? But it's easy now to look at Pastor Joe and go, I want what he's got. And a lot of times, doesn't social media kind of build up that jealousy in us? Maybe you're not intending to make other people jealous, or maybe they're not your friends. But so often we see each other's highlight reels, and then we start getting jealous going, oh, man, I wish I had that. You know, how come they get that? That's not fair. And we don't understand the journeys and the prices that people have paid. I am blessed. That is true. But I've had to wait a long time to be at this place called here. Listen, everybody. The place I now call here used to be there. I used to stand back and say, one day I'll be over there and the church will pay for our bills. One day I'll be over there and my wife and I will have enough money to save at the end of every month instead of spending it to the penny. One day I'll have kids that will be able to fill in this house and we won't just be alone anymore. And so I used to point to a place over there while I was here, but now I'm here and it once used to be there. 
You see, the funny thing about God is that he'll bring you there and a suddenly, and all of a sudden, I look back and I go, wow, there's a lot of places that I've been over these years. Six kids now, a growing church, all of these wonderful things. And am I saying it's always a stair step of success? No, my journey of success sometimes looks more like a connect the dots than a ladder. A ladder is just boop, 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 boop. No, mine's like go over here and then go over here, Joe. And then you're going to go down here, up here and around here a couple times, and then you're going to go over here. And then you look back, and you're like, oh, that's a duck swimming in a pond. How many have ever seen Connect the Dots take you on a lot of places? My life has never been like success, 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 success. You know, no, 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 no. It's success, failure, 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 failure. Success, failure, success, failure, success, failure. Success, 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 failure, 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 failure. That's what it feels. How many have a life like that sometimes? And you just keep going. And so part of what you need to do is learn to balance your emotions and rejoice with those who are rejoicing and mourn with those who are mourning. Romans 12, 15. So get this. And, it, and it's so true in this church at the size that we're at now. I see it all the time. Literally this last year, some people lost the closest people to them. We had a leader in this church lose his wife over a flu shot. She had the flu and they gave her a flu shot. She went from just being sick to dead. Talk about tragedy. My friend lost his father while he was on vacation with his friends. I mean, we're talking about loss. We're talking about people losing children or miscarriages. And then in the same year, we did weddings, some of the greatest weddings. People gave birth to children. Uh, miracles happened in people's lives. And so you, you can be in a life group and on one side talking to your friend who, who lost somebody and you can be talking to them going, man, I feel so bad for you. I, I can't even understand how bad this must be. Man, I want to pray for you. I want to love you. Is there anything I can do for you? I'm here for you. And then in the same life group, you can look over and go, man, I'm so happy you just got married and I hear you guys are pregnant now. Boy, we're excited for you. That must be awesome. And it's not like you're going crazy or you're bipolar. It's you're, you're trying to mourn with those who mourn and then rejoice with those who rejoice. And so when we see people going through things, we ought to give them the space that we would want to, to have that emotion. So if I'm rejoicing this year, don't, don't get upset with me because Joe finally got paid. He's taking us out to dinner. We know who's paying for dinner tonight. No, don't get mad. Just rejoice with me. Man, this pastor who's been in ministry over 20 years, his, he has now ha had his salary met. Praise God. And then, and then we can talk to the young adult going, I just moved out of my house. Amen. Everybody clapping. I'm still preaching. Sorry. <laughs> Um, and then we could talk to the young adult. I think it was Jazzy. You were testifying. I just moved out for the first time, and I got all these bills and everything. But God's going to make a way for Jazzy, amen? Because I used to live off that ramen noodle diet too, girl. I've been there before. Haven't even bummed some ramen from somebody. I've been there before. You got some ramen, I'm out. And then lastly, trust that everything that you're going through, God is working for your good. We know this scripture, but let's put it into our memory. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things. Let me say all things. It's not just the good things, it's in the bad things. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so now you should be able to look at your life as a highlight reel of the ups and downs working out for your good. Even the most painful decisions of your life or the mistakes or what people have done to you, as terrifying, as horrible as some of those things were, you can now see God is working out for your good. And I'm glad today that we have a church of second and third chances. Some of you have come from divorces, but if you learn how that marriage ended and now you become a person that is different, you can go on into a new marriage and never have to look back. Some of you are coming out of this year in debt and you learned how not not to spend your money. Now you're going to make better decisions on never going into debt. And I've been there before, blowing up credit cards. And then there was a time that said, I'm not doing that anymore. You know, you can look at the, the failures of your life as a place to have a pity patty party and go, oh, nobody understands. Or you can look at your mistakes as lessons. How many look back at your mistakes and go, I learned something. How many have had to pay a high cost for some of the tuition of life's lessons? See, I've paid a high tuition to Life's Lesson University. 
I've, I'm serious. I've had to pay a lot to Life's Lessons University, and hopefully we're paying a lot less as years go on. We're encouraged by the Word of God to stick with it even when we don't understand it. We listen to wisdom. We pray on our decisions, and as we do, we'll make less mistakes. But even those mistakes can work for your good. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Let's go to this Suddenly. Because so often, once the blessing comes, the miracle comes, you got that new job, you got married, you have kids now, you bought a new house, you forget where you came from. Even in the world, they call this with men and their wives like your come up chick, like Steve Harvey or Michael Jordan. They had this woman that stuck with them through the struggle, through them coming up. But once they came up, they looked around and said, oh, I can do better than this. I'm going to upgrade, get a newer model, less, less years on the, on the tires. I'm going to get a young, young lady, and then I'm going to have her be my wife. But she wasn't there for the come up, was she? And so often I see this too in church. I'm praying with young adults, you know, because our church has a lot of young adults, praying with them to graduate college, get a good job, find someone in life that loves them and that they can start their family together. And then all of a sudden, as they get that job, they act like they're too busy for God now. Well, hold on. I thought we prayed for this. You see, if you don't put your blessings under Christ, your blessings can become a curse. You can let the tail wag the dog. I'm telling somebody something today. You got to listen to me because I've been there before and I've watched too many people allow their blessings to become a curse. God didn't give you children to follow them around eight days a week in 20 different sports and miss church. Listen to me. God didn't give you that job so that now you can have a beach home, but you don't have your spirit life right or your home right. You know, you could have all of that and still lose your mind, your marriage, and your money because divorces cost a lot too, people. And so let's just be honest. We've got to remember where we came from and stay humble. Somebody say, stay humble. Stay humble. Amen. First Peter 5, 5 says, all of you, nudge your neighbor and say, that's you. That's me. That's everybody. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility. Put on humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So listen, I can do all of this in life. And get to the point where I become proud and now God opposes me. Wouldn't that just be a sad story? Here this humble pastor starts with the home Bible study. But then now as it starts to grow, he becomes so prideful, thinks he deserves more than he does, falls from ministry and loses it all. How many times have we heard that sad story? These awesome men and women of God, they start from nothing. They build up something working with the Holy Spirit. God's grace, miracles happen and then like Satan, they want to take a little piece of the pie. See, pray for me that I will always remain humble. I pray for you that as I watch you grow these years and as you take on new challenges, you'll remain humble. You'll be the same person you were uh, as an employee, uh, as a manager now. And those of you who are going to get your degrees, you'll be the same humble person that you were as a high schooler now that you have your doctorate degree or now that you have more money in the bank or that you're retiring and you're going to go move somewhere. Let us all get the mindset of Christ. Christ was in heaven. He had everything, and yet he humbled himself to serve us. No matter what we get from God, let it not turn towards greed, but towards gratitude and to serving and helping others. Amen? The next one that we need to remember is remain in Christ. You see, it was always God that did it. A lot of times people say, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. I started from nothing too, and I built my own business. Nobody gave me a handout. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. What do we say to those people? You're a self-made mess. Really, all you've ever done is mess your own life up. Let me help you. Did you give yourself your brain? Did you give yourself even one molecule of your body? Did you give yourself even the universe that you're doing all these cool things in? You didn't give yourself anything. All you and I have done whenever we do something good is use the gifts and talents and resources and blessings that God has given us. So I know that for us in a culture that doesn't want to acknowledge God, it may not be appropriate every day to take a knee like the guy who scales the touchdown and point to heaven, but you need to get that mindset that all my successes come from God. Remain in Christ. Look at what Jesus said in John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. So bearing fruit is a part of the plan. 
While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will bear even more fruit. You're getting pruned one way or the other. You're either getting pruned, getting cut off, or you're getting pruned so you can bear more fruit. The idea is here, no one stays the same. We're either going forward or backwards at any moment of our life. Now look at what Jesus says in John 3. You are already clean. Talking about how salvation comes from the inside out. So it's not by the works that make you clean. You're not doing more to be more. You be who you be, now you can do what you do. So you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Now remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you what? Remain in me. Somebody say remain in Jesus. Thank you. And so every day of your life, make time to remain in Jesus. It doesn't matter today. Let's just talk about your jobs or your passions. Let's say like you got that promotion. You should pray just as much as you did the day before. Let's say you get a bonus. You should pray this week just like you did before. Let's say all of the dreams you have written down this year happen. You should not disconnect any less from God. Give less time to life groups. Give less time to discipleship because of those blessings. These blessings should only increase your ability to be effective in the body of Christ. They increase our ability, but they don't increase us as people. That's why, everybody listen, everybody listen. When somebody loses a job and they become depressed, were they looking at their identity in Christ or were they looking at their identity in a job? Come on. When somebody goes through trouble with their children or their children do well and graduate and go to college and they have empty nest syndrome, is that because their hope was in Christ or was their hope in their family always being their identity? You see, you cannot put your hope in anything less than Christ and his righteousness. It will all fail you, people. How many know that? You've had money in your hands, and it hasn't changed you, has it? You've had friends, great friends, hasn't changed you. You've fallen in love, many of you, and it hasn't changed you. Everything after Christ is a blessing for our good. Don't get me wrong, but if you ever now try to plug into it, it would be like taking one of these plugs out of a socket and trying to plug it into a brick wall. No matter what this brick wall has as a purpose, as good as a purpose this brick wall is to hold up the wall, that is a great purpose. It can never do the purpose of bringing power and electricity. No matter how great a job is, no matter how great your family is, no matter how great your successes are, those things can never power your soul and give you your identity. It comes from Christ. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Let's go to the second to last one, help others in their waiting. You've got to give back now. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. So some of you know that I love boating. That's like my hobby. And one of the things that I did as an early father and husband, I did what some of y'all are doing. This is where I paid a high uh, price for the Life Lessons University. I took all of our tax money, and I spent it on a boat. Now, you might not have spent it on a boat, but I'm sure some of you have taken all your tax money and blown it on something, you know, like a TV or, you know, new clothes or whatever. That's, that's the most foolish thing to do. Save your tax money, invest it, do something smart with it. But I did, and I had to learn the hard way, so I went out and got me this boat. I love this boat. Only lasted about a month, and it broke down, and I lost all my money. It's a sad story, isn't it? I lost my boat. But I love boating. And so for the last many, like say 10 years, I've been wanting to get another boat. And every time I've tried to do it, the Lord said, no, now's not the time. Because listen to me, the right thing at the wrong time is still wrong. You see, you may be single in here today, and you may be ready to mingle, and that person may be ready to mingle, but if it's not time for you guys to mingle, you'll mess up what could have been a great relationship. And it may be true that some of you need to move out of relationships or quit that job or do something drastic like that, but if you do it the wrong way, if you do the right thing at the wrong time, the wrong way, it's still the wrong thing. And so God wanted me to have a boat because I think God cares about our hobbies. How many think God cares about your hobbies? You all have them. God cares about them. And God wanted me to do it the right way. So guess what? This is the year where I finally had a salary where I could say, okay, in our budget, we're saving X amount of dollars. We don't need to use tax money. Now I'm paying more than they're giving. Come on, somebody. See, some people want to stay broke just so they can get those shekels. It ain't worth it. Prosper, amen, prosper. Okay, so I said, well, I'll give up that kickback if I can make more here and put in work. Well, we, we figured it out. We can get a boat. 
and we got a boat. And so now the Wyrostic family has a boat. And I want to be honest, this is not to brag, but this is to tell you my heart. The first thing I said to my wife, and I'll cry telling you about this because it's special to me, is I said, get enough life jackets for all of our friends to be on this boat. The maximum capacity is like 18, and I said, get 18 life jackets. I said, I never want anyone in our church to not have the opportunity to have a boat. Most of us didn't grow up with parents that had boats, and most of you don't even know what we do on boats, like wakeboarding and skiing and tube and all that. Some of you had the privilege of doing that, but, but you get my point. And I just began to think to myself, this is what I wish somebody would have did for me. Because I had acquaintances, maybe one friend in the wakeboarding world, and you know what they would say to me, most of my acquaintances? They said, Joe, we'll take you on the boat, but every time you go on the back of the boat, we're going to charge you $10. So every time I wanted to go water skiing or wakeboarding, $10. I wanted to go three times in one day, $30. And we know gas doesn't cost that. They were just making money off of me. And I began to say to myself, when I get a boat, come on, somebody, when I get blessed, I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to help others with what I have. Now, you may not have a boat, but you might have a car, so take somebody in your car. You, you may not own a restaurant, but you might have some extra lunch. You may not have all the clothes in the world, but you have something you can share. If we look at what God is blessing us with to be a blessing to others, we can change the world and show him that we're not spoiled kids, that we're, we're going to use whatever he gives us to bless others. And so many of you I see doing that in the church. We have a Good Samaritan page. Join that this year if you haven't. And instead of garage sailing it, just give it away. If you can, give it away and you'll have the joy of giving to others. The Bible says carry their burdens. It's a blessing to help somebody else. When you take them out on that boat one day, you're going to see a smile on your, you know, your children's face or these kinds of things. Or you take somebody for a ride and they didn't have to catch an Uber. It's a blessing. It lightens their load. I want to lighten people's loads. And then lastly, as Adam comes, and it's not least. Somebody say, it's last, last. but it's not, it's not least. This is the best thing you better remember. Always give God the glory. Amen. Psalm 91, 1 through 2 says, I will give thanks to you, Lord. With all of my heart, I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. We should look at our lives as being God's trophies. God has made us to show off his grace. Not in a braggadocious way, not for us to go, hey, look, I'm a king's kid. I'm so blessed. You know, not to be like that, but we should be a light to this dark world. We should give them encouragement by what God has done in our lives. We should be able to give glory to God and say, God did it. Others didn't make it. I made it, but by the grace of God, to him be the glory. Other marriages didn't survive, but ours did. By God's grace, to him be the glory. Other people lost their minds. I didn't. It wasn't in me, though. I was going crazy. It felt like everything was falling apart. But by God's grace, he did it. To him be the glory. And as we end today, look at this last uh, thought. And let's put it in our hearts. What are we waiting for, for God to do us suddenly in? We got to get the wait part right. And we also got to get the suddenly part right. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you today. As you're seated, band and altar workers, would you come? I just sense the Lord in this place. I sense so many of you are expecting great things this year. So before we close out in singing and praying, would you look at your life right now? Where are you waiting for the breakthrough? Where are you waiting for the suddenly? How long have you been waiting there? It's okay to be honest with God and talk about it and say, Lord, I've been waiting. I've been waiting so long for this. Lord, it hurts. Talk to him about it. But then hear a promise in your heart today. If you haven't learned how to do that yet, it's called reading your word to hear God's voice. Some of you already have a promise for that thing you're waiting for. Just start to speak it over your life right now. Those of you who just only feel the pain of it, ask God this week to give you a promise in that situation as you read your scriptures. Because God is still speaking. A few moments, some of you might be waiting for a breakthrough in your family. Maybe someone you love is not saved. Hold on to that promise. You and your household will be saved. Somebody might be sick today, and it doesn't feel good even to come to church, and you wish you were feeling better, but you don't know how to stop it, or the doctors can't do much about it. 
Would you today, in the midst of your pain, say, Lord, I'm waiting for your healing, either in this life or the next. By your stripes I am healed. You're my healer, Jesus. Some of you might be waiting for a financial breakthrough. You're going through things where you just feel like, man, I can never make these ends meet. There is too much weak and not enough money. Too many bills, not enough bank. Would you just pray to God right now and say, he shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I believe, God. I believe. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Few moments, few moments. Even if you got to move from your seat, you can do it. You can come and get prayer. We'll stand in just a moment, but if you got to come, come now. We're not going to make that weird at all. We love when you come hungry to pray. But a few more moments before we stand. Are you waiting? for something that you have given up on. Maybe a happy home. Maybe you're already on your second marriage. Maybe you already have two baby mama, two baby daddies, and you're just thinking, man, I don't see how this could ever work out. Boy, you would be surprised what God can do in those situations. Would you just say, Lord, I'm trusting you for me and my house to serve you all the days of my life.